Good morning. It's so great to be with you all this morning. So great to be in this venue. It's actually embarrassingly the first time I've been in this space and I live just down the street, so there's no excuse for that and I will be back. But um, this is an, a really awesome space. Um, I want to thank uh, Cody and everybody um, here at Creative Mornings and of course at The Signal and everyone else who's had a part in, um, in this really amazing series uh, for inviting me. It's really an honor to talk to you guys all today. And um, just a, a, a little quick intro for those who don't know me a little bit uh, more about that. Um, so I'm, I'm basically coming here to talk to you as a composer and as a pianist. Um, I'm a musician and I'm, I'm just incredibly lucky that uh, over the last couple of years I've been able to um, make my living writing music, which is pretty obscure. I kind of feel like this is one of those weird um, bring your, your dad to class show and tell kind of things where it's like, what do you do? Is that something you can do for a living? <laughs> and actually, uh, I'm just, I feel very lucky that um, over the last three or th two or three years um, that I've been able to do that. And that's something interesting to talk about, but that's not really the whole reason and what I'm here to, to speak with you about. Um, we're talking about chaos today, um, but there's an interesting connection, um, obviously, between my work and that that might be interesting to explore. And most importantly, I want you to think, as I'm talking to you this morning, about how my story and how the connections that, um, that I've made might apply to your work regardless of whether you're an artist or not. So of course we have some artists in this room and we also have some people whose work is not traditionally thought of as, as art. That's of course part of the mission as I understand it of Creative Mornings is realizing that there is creativity in everything that we do and, and so just want to uh, encourage you to keep that on your mind as, as I talk this morning. Nothing's better for your work than a little crisis. I'm a composer and a pianist who, after 33 years of craft refinement, has grown to hate composing and dislike much of music. But to avoid turning a very early morning into a very depressing morning, I thought I'd go back to the beginning when things were a little bit happier. So I wrote this little piece when I was probably seven or eight years old under the tutelage of an eccentric and wonderful teacher from Brooklyn who settled in Tennessee for some reason. And for some reason we bumped into each other and began that ancient and terrifying dance of mentor and student. Terrifying for the mentor also, terrifying for the mentor also as I would discover many years later that being a teacher is one of the most terrifying things that you can possibly do. I like these old pieces. Um, they have a lot of chaos. And I won't say that I like them because of their lack of structure, because that would be to say that uh, refinement of craft has nothing to do with being a good artist. But still, I like them. I kept writing. I was lucky enough to have piano teachers and violin teachers and conducting teachers who all said, keep writing music. And that's not common um, for those of you who have been through traditional music education in the, in the US. Um, they also told me something that would really shape my formal years. They drilled into me a strong sense that the population of the world was exploding. And because the population of the world was exploding, that there was one thing that I really had to do. And that was specialize. That's what's drilled into us, right? Specialize, specialize. You'll never get noticed in your field unless you specialize. For me, music wasn't enough. I specialized in performance. Then I narrowed down to historical performance. Then I narrowed down to historical keyboard performance in the late 17th and early 18th century. Then I narrowed down to music of the late 18th and 17th and early 18th century in North German and Dutch music. And once in grad school when I found myself sitting at a keyboard at a pipe organ built around the time Europeans were just beginning to settle the new world. And my teacher was debating the sound differences between the ratio of lead in the organ pipes at 2 a.m. I realized that I'd gone way too far in my search for specialization in refinement of craft. Think about what you do, whether it's writing music or making a perfect cup of coffee or simply uh, painting or trail running 
There was probably a time when you began to simplify your skill. After mastering elaborate techniques, you find that the work contracts. After 30, 33 years of writing music, the work for me began distilling itself. Musical composers have until now been essentially tunesmiths. Mozart wrote tunes. Schoenberg wrote atonal tunes. John Cage was a tunesmith with non-musical sounds. I was in good company writing tunes. But I became more and more weary of making tunes. This is the obvious place for a composer to go when he gets tired of writing tunes. I turned to performance art. I began numbering all of my sound compositions. This is work number 138. The interesting thing about this work is that I expected a burning piano to be an adrenalized performance. But it was an incredibly quiet, meditative, and beautiful experience. The light, buzzing note of each string as they broke and the giant carcass of the instrument slowly swaying and finally lumbering to the ground after almost 45 minutes. It was like watching a large animal peacefully die. Chaos is not always intense. Sometimes it quietly moves you to do something, to try something else. I tried simply focusing on connections with individual audience members. Um, I think I did a, 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 a several works that tried to get at this, and that reminds me of the work of um, Abramovich, who, um, who, in her search for connection with audience members, would perform silently, wordlessly, sitting across a table from a single audience member gazing into their eyes. I did a series of unclothed performances and again experienced, rather than shock, a calm and intensified connection with my audience. I remember standing naked backstage at a tiny venue in Barcelona ready to walk onto the stage where I had taken apart a small upright piano the rough cement under my toes, simply hoping to lock in with my audience's attention and focus. I was sure that at least some people would walk out or laugh or at the very least find it distracting. No one moved an inch for the entire performance. Chaos isn't always exciting, but it almost always brings me focus. The next chance I had to dive into chaos was when I discovered the discipline of rock climbing. I know there's some climbers in this room, at least two. The biggest misconception about climbing is that it is primarily a game of strength. While this is partially true, it has as much to do with balance and timing and transferring weight and energy around the body. Climbing has much more in common with dance than any sport. Any dancers here? Okay, climbers and dancers, you need to talk to each other. There's a lot to talk about there. You'll hear climbers talk a lot about the artfulness, the artfulness of climbing. While these things were obviously attractive and helpful to me as an artist, these components of rock climbing, what was really most helpful was the simple act of jumping into chaos again, embracing the discipline of something that forced me to dive deeply into a completely different culture and put me among a new peer group that spoke differently, that embraced life differently. And almost 20 years later, rock climbing continues to influence every moment of my creativity. As artists, it's our job to embrace chaos in this way. But it's only helpful if we keep our artist's perspective close while we do it. If you were to dive into something completely new and different, how would it affect your personal work? What would it teach you about your craft? Climbing really coincided with my work in theatrical compositions, thinking in larger scales, focusing on physicality and movement. So I created theatrical works. Anything that wasn't traditional music composition. I pushed the boundaries as far as I could with what I could possibly consider to be music. For example, for a long time I found it hard to justify any real distinction at all between human speech and music. 
and to some extent, I still can't. I began writing music as speech. In 2013, I wrote a piece called Composition for Two Performers, in which spoken words are orchestrated into the musical score. This is this, a page from the score. Words are spoken by the performers while they're playing and actually written as if they were phrases of music. I went as far as I could go and eventually it became obvious that sound itself was not enough. This is a tough place for a composer and a musician to be. Is it possible to be a composer and not deal with sound? This is where I really dove in deep. This morning I want to present the possibility to you that there are two types of music. One, music that is played, experienced, and deeply felt by the player. And two, music that is consumed, passive, received, and certainly more predominant in our culture. This second kind of music, this passive kind, is not really the kind that interests me today. The first kind, experienced, played, physical. Roland Barthes writes in his incredible essay, Musica Practica, quote, the music one plays comes from an activity that is very little auditory. It is manual and thus, in a way, much more sensual a muscular music in which the part taken by the sense of hearing is only that of ratification. Again, a muscular music in which the part taken by the sense of hearing is one only of ratification, end quote. Music that doesn't have to do with hearing? On the most basic level, think of a music teacher inviting the student to feel the beat as a constant physical inter internal phenomenon while playing. I had another teacher when I was young who used to push me on the back so that I'd feel the pulse of the meter and the ebb and flow of the phrases, physically pushing on my back. I remember when, the moment when all of these trails of thought converged for me as I was watching the wonderful Art 21 documentary series. Anyone see, everyone seen that series? If you haven't, check it out, download it, check it out from the library, Art 21. I came across a segment on Bruce Nauman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bruce Nauman is um, considered one of the most important artists of our generation. And in this Art 21 segment, I remember I paused, I was um, kind of stopped out of my tracks by a video footage of his installation in New Mexico called Stairway 2000. Um, Stairway is essentially a set of stairs that's installed on a hillside. And the interesting thing about these steps is that they're all different heights and depths. So uh, there's not a regular pattern to the stairs uh, coming down the, uh, the hill. The camera pans down in this R21 series, slowly down the set of stairs, looking at them head on so that you can see the differences in height. One step is 12 inches, the next step is 8 inches, the next step is 16 inches, and the camera slowly pans down the set of stairs. And as the camera panned down, I, was, I imagined myself walking down those stairs. And as I watched, I knew exactly how those stairs would feel. Long step, short step, short step, long step, long step. Exactly the same way that I felt as my teacher nudged a rhythm into my back. And suddenly I realized that Bruce Nauman had created what I still consider to be one of the most incredible musical compositions ever created. A musical composition completely without sound, a simple set of stairs whose rhythm is built in and cannot be heard, but only felt by the audience member. This gets us into the world of physical, body, sensory qualities of music. But taken a step further, 
this type of music I was searching for doesn't exist in the performing nor in the hearing, but in the doing, the writing, and the reading in the semiotic sense of the word. Again, Bart, quote, with respect to this music, one must put oneself in the position of, or better, the, op the activity of the operator who knows how to displace, assemble, combine, fit together. What is the use of, compo of composing if it is to confine the product within the precinct of the concert or the solitude of listening to the radio? To compose is to give to do, not to give to hear, but to give to write. To compose is not to give to do, not to give to hear, but to give to write. The person walking down Bruce Nauman's staircase is writing the composition in his or her own body, in a place that can't be heard, but only felt. Even though Bruce had beat me to the punch in creating my ideal piece of musical composition, it did give me another gift. After a few, mo after, after a few months of pouting because I hadn't thought of the staircase myself, I had a rather helpful epiphany. I began to look at my big mess of disjointed work in a new way. I began to realize that my treatments of material of non-musical sound, of the stage, of movement itself, all had one thing in common. I was treating them in the same way that I treated music. What was really important was that I was able to embrace what really made me unique, a composer's viewpoint. Sculpture as a composer would, movement as a composer would, text as a composer would. Being a composer doesn't restrict me to sound, it allows me to bring my composer's perspective to any medium that I choose. What would you really want to embrace? What if you were really to embrace what makes you unique? What would you bring to another medium or discipline based on your poet's perspective or your spatial architecture awareness? If you dove into chaos and it brought you into a completely new discipline, how would your unique training and mastery exhibit itself? I wish I could say that I found a completely new and perfect musical language for myself. I wish I could say that this epiphany set me on a clear path. The thing about chaos is that it drives radical change, but still requires bold artistic dis disciplines and decisions. Following chaos means never being sure, but always trusting that you're on the best path. I can, I can say that it has given me the freedom to go back to making traditional music with real sound, again, and sometimes I make things that are very bizarre and don't make much sense to anyone but me. As creative people, that's all we can really do, and it's the best place to be, embracing chaos. And in that place, I'm more sure than ever, even though my work doesn't always seem that way. So in the spirit of chaos, um, I want to share just one small clip of something that I've, that I've made recently. Um, Cody and I talked about having this presentation have a performative element, and I just thought that this early in the morning, something so weird might be not, not a lot of fun. But. <laughs> But I did want to leave you with um, a, a little example of my work. Um, here's a video from pretty recently. This is work number 152. This five doesn't work, no problem. I don't think it's going to work for us this morning. But I will say that, um, that you can hear uh, my most recent composition uh, performed by the Chattanooga Symphony next month, October 25. Um, so if you, if you attend the symphony concerts, um, and you really should, this, this year's season is really incredible. A lot of very experimental work and um, recently created work. So um, mine will be on the October 25 uh, concert. Thank you all so much for, for being here and for listening. Being such a great audience. Thank you.